All right, let's get started. Welcome back. I hope you had a good weekend, a uh, longer weekend for Veterans Day. Uh, so this is our last full week before the holiday break, and I have a few updates for you as you're preparing and starting to think about that. Um, so uh, for this week, we're going to be looking at the role of relationships, the ways that relationships develop and the ways that relationships are communicated, whether it's close family relationships, friends, romantic relationships, anywhere in between. Uh, communication plays a central role in how we develop the relationships that we want, how we develop as human beings in the ways that we would like to, and in negotiating the challenges as adults of trying to develop meaningful relationships for our lives. So to get us started for today, uh, thinking back to last week, I know it's been a minute, uh, I'd like us to take a couple minutes on this practice question. We'll talk about it together and recap some of the things from last week. So which theory of mediated communication presents the concept of hyper-personal communication? These uh, could be uses and gratification theory, social presence theory, media richness theory, or social information processing theory. So I'll give you a couple minutes on that. We'll talk about it together, and we'll talk about some of the new stuff for this week. Okay, anybody who would like some additional time on this question? Let's talk about it. So, uh, which has hyperpersonal communication? How many folks say uses and gratification? How many people say social presence? Media richness? Social information processing? So I'm seeing a lot of missing hands. Are there folks who are having some trouble or questions on these? So the best answer here is social information processing theory. We used time in last Wednesday's class to go over some of these different theories. I know it's been a minute, uh, but I definitely recommend recapping those theories. If you did last week's Canvas prompt, it asked you to contrast some of these theories too. 
right? Uses and gratifications theory says that media's role is small and we have a lot of power to choose what media we use in our lives. Good example is um, going to Netflix or a screen, streaming app and getting to choose what to watch. Social presence theory is identifying the role of presence, how uh, involved we are using media. For example, are we idling with video and audio off on Zoom or are we really engaged in a phone call? Media richness is about how different forms of media might involve more sensory engagement and content. For example, uh, very asynchronous and stilted email versus a very engaged uh, and thoughtful conversation online. Social information processing theory brings forth the idea of hyper-personal communication. And Joseph Walker's argument in social information processing is that media has the power to create relationships that are even closer and more engaged than face-to-face -face relationships. It argues that the dynamic elements of media, if you're playing a game together, if you're on the phone together, if you're able to talk with that person online outside of your face-to-face -face interactions, can be a big step toward creating relationships that are even closer. How many people have seen the movie Her? Heard of that movie? So, not very many. Um, so uh, that movie came out a few years ago, starring Joaquin Phoenix. The premise of the movie is that he forms a relationship with an artificial intelligence that's just a voice, right? That he starts to develop romantic feelings for this artificial intelligence uh, because she's always there. He's always able to talk to her and she develops and grows and learns from the basis of talking with her online, right? So it's an example of social information processing theory in action. Knowing and being able to contrast these theories is a good thing that you should be prepared for as we gear up for the final exam at the end of the term. So I definitely recommend refreshing on that if you are a little bit uncertain about your responses here. So last class, we talked about some of these theories and we also discussed the role that media plays in identity development. We looked at Eric Erickson's different stages of development, the idea that our relationships are shaped by different crises and challenges that we have about identity. For instance, how do I belong in this world? Have I lived a good life? Those are things we find ourselves asking depending on the stage that we're in. And um, we use media as a way to develop and understand our senses of identity too. So this week, we're looking at relationships, understanding some of the characteristics of them, uh, why relationships matter in our everyday life, and also helping you as you're gearing up for your recording and reflection essay to be thinking about some of the ways that these ideas might be relevant to the work that you're putting in. All right. So recording and reflection essay is coming up in a week. It's due this Sunday. How many folks have already had your conversation? Okay, so a number of you. If you have not, I really recommend getting that conversation in as soon as possible because it takes a little while to transcribe that conversation. And it's also going to take some time to go from that to the writing of the essay itself where you're applying and using concepts from the course, right? So as a reminder, uh, this assignment is due uh, by Sunday. And as a result of that, because we have that essay coming up, there is not a Canvas prompt due this week. Instead, just focus on getting an essay in. Um, if you are in need of an extension due to an emergency or something that is coming up for you, uh, please let me know. Again, I ask you to do so a week in advance, so let me know by the end of the day today if you do need an extension on this assignment. Let me know to when you need that extension, and we can work with you on that. I have included the rubric and expectations for the assignment, right, the way that I'm grading and looking through the recording and reflection essay. Uh, and all of those elements on Canvas. Um, so that goes over all of the different parts of organization, structure, and so on. So I really recommend looking through the rubric on Canvas and using that to inform the way that you're writing and completing the essay. In your submission, you should include the following, and you can include it all together as a single document, uh, or you can submit multiple documents. If you resubmit, I have the chance to see each of the things that you've submitted. So you are welcome to resubmit. The first thing you need to include is the transcription, right? The transcription is the written version of the audio of the conversation. So you do not need to upload an MP3 or a video of the audio. I'm asking you to take that audio and write it down uh, and get that down word for word of the section of the conversation that you're choosing to analyze. Uh, I've also included the example 
uh, of uh, transcription on Canvas that you can use too if you're struggling to figure out uh, how to um, describe that conversation in a written form. Uh, you can use things such as abbreviations or initials as you're working through that, but do make sure to include the transcription. And remember, the transcription does not count toward the requirements of the essay itself, right? It doesn't count toward the page numbers, but it is required to be included. The analysis um, is asking you, now that you have that transcription and you've reflected on that conversation, to use concepts from the course uh, and apply them to understand what's happening in that conversation. For example, you might use social information processing theory to talk about the importance uh, of hyperpersonal communication and the importance of communicating with that person online. Or you might use an idea from this week where we're talking about the stages of relationship development and what stage you believe that relationship to be at. Or you could use ideas uh, such as social penetration theory and the different layers of disclosure and identity development you found in the relationship. Generally speaking, using two or three major concepts or ideas from the course that form the body of your essay is a good idea. And then um, please make sure that you are including a full work cited or reference list, right? Uh, I showed you last week how a citation machine, if you enter in the title of the book, will autofill and give you a full MLA, APA, or Chicago citation. Uh, I've also included on Canvas the front matter of the textbook that includes all of the information that you need to include uh, full site to be the latest MLA, APA, or Chicago. Please uh, remember you need both in text citations and a work cited list. Um, Please do not procrastinate on those things, right? I would much rather have you turn it in late that includes the citations than to turn it in on time without those. You don't cite your sources with in text and work cited, it's a zero. So please make sure that you are citing properly uh, and let me know if you need any help with citing from the book. Any questions about this essay, knowing that this is coming up in the week? Yeah, Z. Aside from the uh, book itself, will we have any requirement to have a certain number of other citations from journals or whatever? Or is just for the Good question. Nope. You only need to cite from the book. If you want to cite from something externally, you can, but I just say be cautious about that. Generally speaking, you shouldn't need to cite from something else and it might risk distracting from the focus of your essay. Any other questions? And again, I'm happy to look over a rough draft or outline. Just get that to me by Friday. It's optional, uh, but I am willing to look at it and give you that. Yeah. Uh, if we took notes on like the branch reading and we just took regular notes and all the pages they were on, does that matter? I would actually be read with the page number of the content. Can you refer to your notes or do you have to refer to Yeah, can I refer my notes? I mean, can <laughs> I would refer to the book, right? Because if you have your notes, right, your notes should be able to easily take you to a section of the book that's discussing those things. So what I would just do is take some of the terms or the ideas that you're bringing into your notes and just control F them, right? And find there's a page number or part. And because there's the different headings and subheadings, right? It should pretty easily, if you just do a quick skim, uh, help you to identify where that term is being listed or talked about. It's a good question. Any other questions? Awesome. So best of luck as you're continuing to work on this. Um, I look forward to seeing what you are developing with this. And uh, one thing, because I know this is a pretty busy time of year that I want to share that will hopefully help you, is um, while we'll be discussing relationships in uh, today and Wednesday's class, um, because this is due by Sunday, um, what I want to do is give you the chance for some additional work time and uh, flexibility. I also know a lot of you are probably heading out early or traveling for athletics or something else uh, for um, going up to Thanksgiving break. So this Friday, uh, kind of similar to the uh, day before we started the midterm, um, you're welcome to come to class. It'll be a chance for us to workshop if you just want a quiet place or you want a space for me to answer questions or work with you on preparing for your essay. Um, Friday will be an attendance optional workshop day, right? So you're welcome to come to class. Uh, I will help you out. You can have a nice quiet space to work if you need it. If you are out of town or you um, could not uh, want to come to class to work on this, um, you don't need to come to class and I'm not taking attendance. So 
hopefully that's useful and helpful for you as you're wrapping up and working on this assignment. Also remember that the following week is the week of Thanksgiving break. So we do not have class meetings the 21st, 23rd, or 26th. So uh, basically, um, after the Thanksgiving break, we have our final two weeks of the term, right? So um, those uh, that's getting pretty close to the finish line. This is week eight out of 10. One last thing, uh, if you're thinking ahead for your planning and scheduling is that we don't meet for the final exam time, right? So the final exam is just like the midterm in that you take it wherever you want through Canvas uh, in a 72 hour period that'll be during the final exam window. Uh, so uh, during that time, do not need to come to class. Uh, so we'll have uh, after this week, six more class meetings uh, for the final two weeks. No, I covered some housekeeping and things, but are there any other questions before we get started? I right. am confusing uh, emails and whatnot, and whether we have next week off or whether we just get the same one. Yeah. Just open yeah. Yeah. So I, my understanding is the building and facilities and so on will be open, as uh, Kirsten was mentioning. Yeah. So we do not meet for classes next week. All good questions. Thanks for asking. So let's get into relationships, right? And um, if we're thinking about the past couple of years in particular, the ways that we've been navigating COVID, um, our relationships have not developed always the ways that we wanted to. We've lost touch with a lot of friends, people close to us. We haven't been able to do the same visiting um, and spending time with other people. Uh, many people coming out of that have realized that uh, relationships and relationship development is important for us. Close family member and uh, I were talking the other day and we were saying, you know, there's a lot of challenges we found over the last couple of years. And one thing we realized is we might be introverted and we might enjoy spending time on our own, but we're not that introverted. And so what we've seen is a shift where a lot of people have placed greater value onto relationships and spending quality time when in many ways that was deprived for a period. So relationships matter in the context of fulfilling significant human needs, right? Humans are social creatures. Um, we derive a lot of our pleasure and enjoyment from our ability to connect and spend time with other people. Even if we're more introverted and we recharge by being alone, we still enjoy uh, spending time with other people and developing relationships with other people. We can think back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. A lot of our loving and belonging needs are associated with developing meaningful relationships with other people. Our ability to connect and relate to other people forms an important basis of how we're able to grow. And interpersonal communication is a huge part of how our relationships happen, right? Our relationships develop through self-disclosure, through facial expressions and nonverbal communication, uh, through the process of learning and understanding other people. But we also communicate about our relationships. For instance, um, oftentimes a refrain in a developing romantic relationship is to say, well, what are we, right? Or asking a question about the label or identifier on a relationship. So not only uh, do we communicate to build relationships, we use communication to develop a vocabulary and understanding of what relationships are and how we can comprehend the relationships that we've developed over the course of our lives. So we use communication uh, to fulfill and understand our relationships. When we think about relationships, right, um, and categorizing our relationships, we think about relationships in a lot of different ways. One of the biggest ways is to think about a duration, right? It's an easy way of defining relationships. How long have you been um, in communication with that other person? One thing that makes a lot of our family relationships unique is that we have had those relationships from a very young age. Somebody has been involved in our lives for as long as we can remember. And so oftentimes that shapes the bond that you form with that person, right? We think back to social penetration theory and uncertainty reduction theory, it takes time to break down walls, to understand and to feel more comfortable talking with that other person. There are just going to be topics that you don't discuss with that person or patterns of behavior that you don't understand uh, that come to be developed over time, right? We think about this in the context of a lot of our favorite shows or movies, right? 
A lot of these are based off of characters developing relationships over a course of time on the basis of familiarity. In fact, studies say that we're more physically attracted to people that have been in our lives for a longer period of time, which is why oftentimes a lot of coworkers uh, start to become involved with each other because of the proximity, the familiarity that comes with the duration of their relationship. Contact frequency also occurs to how often or long you communicate with somebody else, right? So yes, you could be working with somebody for a long time, but if they're like down the hall and they're never in their office and you never really talk to them that much, right? Or somebody is CC'd on an email, but you never really meet them or spend much quality time with them. Well, that's not going to make a relationship develop. So how often you communicate with that person plays a really big role. How often do you talk with friends or family on the phone? How often do you text people? How regularly do you message or communicate? Those tie to contact frequency. We think back to social penetration theory and this idea that over time, we start to share some of the more central layers to our identity and who we are, right? Over time, we start to share our beliefs, our convictions, and our goals and dreams for ourselves, right? So sharing and how much we disclose to others is another big factor. Oftentimes, we find ourselves in positions where we might strategically disclose or not share everything about ourselves with other people. We have a relative or uh, somebody that we know, and we know that we disagree with them on a topic or issue. Uh, we might be selective in our sharing, right? We might think about what's appropriate to share in a professional context, like in, uh, in a class or at work, and how that inform uh, our identity too. Right? A lot of times people who have chronic illness or disability are oftentimes trying to make a decision about disclosure and to what degree they feel like somebody can support them if they disclose uh, their conditions. Support is a question of how much you can count on that person. Really easy way to measure support and who's supportive uh, for you is to think about who your emergency contact is whenever you're asked to fill out a form. Uh, so support is an important element of our relationships because it tells us who we can lean on and who we can see as a source of that support. Interaction variability is a little bit more complicated, but I think is an interesting idea uh, for how our relationships can be understood. So for instance, uh, high interaction variability means that you can do a lot of different things with that person, or you can have that relationship engaged in a lot of different dimensions. Say uh, you have a really close friend or roommate. Not only are you all into sports and you like to watch the games together, but you also really like biking, going outside. You also really like to bend and talk about your feet, right? You get to do a whole different uh, set of things with that person and communicate and relate to that person on multiple levels. That would be high interaction variability, right? But let's say you have another friend. And the only way to really relate to that friend is that you both uh, really like a certain sports team. Well, that might be a good way to connect with that person. You don't really have much else in common, and it can be hard to relate to that person and develop a relationship outside of that specific context, right? So interaction variability is how differently aspects of the relationship might exist. And then lastly, we have differences in terms of goals, right? So goals um, are about what you and the other person see as the purpose and function and uh, of the relationship and where that relationship might be headed. Really good example of this is uh, several years ago, right? There was a film that came out called Friends with Benefits uh, that uh, had Justin Timberlake and Dylan Kudis, and it was right an example of a friend where there were people who were just friends, right, but were sexually involved with each other. Uh, and that was based off of a mutual understanding of what was considered to be the goals of a relationship. Neither of them wanted to be in a serious relationship uh, or to be really romantically involved, but they were interested in that kind of contact with each other, right? Oftentimes, we have friction in our relationships if we see a mismatch of our goals uh, with the other people, right? So a lot of the drama, if you could imagine from that film, is that uh, they start to realize that they want something else, but what does the other person want, right? <laughs> or uh, maybe you're regularly in touch with a friend, but that person is texting and messaging you constantly, and you kind of want them to back up a little bit and give you some space, right? So you might have different expectations, and you might choose to share them and say, hey, 
uh, I'm really busy. I'm not really able to talk as much, right? And your goal is a little bit more based on autonomy. Uh, or maybe you choose not to disclose and share uh, a difference in goals that you have, right? Communication is a way that we can understand some differences in terms of the goals and beliefs that members of a group might have. In terms of relationships that are both uh, romantic or platonic, right, the role of attraction does play an important part of how our relationships develop, right? Uh, physical attraction, um, whether or not we find somebody to be aesthetically pleasing, uh, is an important element of relationship development. Uh, in fact, right, in a lot of professional contexts, people that are considered by a culture or group to be better looking are people that generally uh, are more likely to get a job or be viewed as highly. Uh, one thing to consider is that what is considered to be attractive is different across culture and context, right? So for instance, the role of body image, uh, BMI, and other indicators, well, what's considered attractive can look really different depending on the individual uh, a group and their own beliefs. Social attraction, right? It's the idea of seeing somebody as fun or engaging to be around. So uh, maybe there's somebody in your dorm who is incredibly outgoing and fun, and you think to yourself, it'd be great to be close to friends with this person. They really seem like uh, they are, you know, the talk of the town and a lot of fun to talk. So social attraction is definitely something that we see as a really big indicator. Is somebody funny? Are they interesting or engaging? And then task attraction, right? Is the idea that we're drawn to somebody uh, who has specific knowledge or expertise uh, that is able to help us with uh, specific goals or things that are important in our lives. From a kind of basic level, right, we as human beings are going to be drawn toward people that we feel like can mutually protect or support us and support what we're doing in our lives. So task attraction um, is oftentimes a survival strategy that we'll use. Uh, so for instance, if you're struggling uh, with uh, an issue with technology, right? You would be attracted towards somebody who would be able to resolve that issue. So if somebody is really good with computers, right? Uh, and you have a friend who's able to help you resolve that issue, you're drawn to that person on that basis. We can also think about our attraction to other people uh, in terms of a variety of different questions, right? And these questions frame how we see that person as significant or important to our life. One of those questions is our proximity. Is this somebody that we're close to and that we're regularly engaged with? Again, a lot of uh, classic examples from shows and films help us see this, right? Characters Jim and Pam in the office develop a close relationship with each other, in part because they're in the same office building and they're constantly interacting with each other. So we feel attraction on the basis of our proximity and our regular engagement with other people. As human beings, right, we like patterns, we like predictability. And so the more we feel comfortable and able to predict what a person is going to do, the more we're willing to let our guard down with that person. Our physicality deals with this idea of an active presence with that other person. Again, this gets to the idea that if we're engaging in meaningful or perhaps even hyper-personal communication with that person, that plays a really big role. A lot of how things like catfishing work is that it's regular contact and communication and uh, messaging with that person. You really feel an active presence with that person who doesn't turn out to be who they say they are. So a lot of people are shocked when they're catfished because they think, I thought I knew this person. I don't understand. Perceived gain uh, is an important element too. At some level, right, we have relationships that fulfill needs for us. There is something that we see ourselves as getting out of our relationships. And no, we're not necessarily callous and detached, right? We don't say, hmm, is this friend beneficial to me? Will my net pleasure go up by spending time with this person, right? It doesn't work like that. Um, it's not a video game. But um, at some level, right, there is something that we see as good or positive in our relationships. Our similarities and differences with that person. Um, are we interesting? And do we find that other person as also uh, interesting to us, right? So there is, of course, a whole debate and discussion about whether or not opposites attract. Um, we find ourselves attracted to people who share things in common with us uh, because it provides activities, disclosure, a sense of understanding and belonging. 
but we might also find ourselves drawn to differences that uh, really make that person unique. Oh, wow, you've been to Germany before. How was that? Uh, I've never really been there. Uh, can you tell me about that? And then disclosure. Again, lastly, this question of whether or not you share um, and open up certain details with that person. So all of these questions can frame whether or not we find ourselves attracted to other people. So again, a lot of science and pop culture over the years has uh, raised the question of whether or not opposites attract. And what studies actually tell us is kind of interesting, right? That typically opposites do not really attract in the context of longer term relationships. In fact, um, studies have found that people tend to be more drawn to and are more interested in initiating and maintaining relationships with people that have uh, differences in social and cultural elements. That is, people can immediately find similarities with that person, uh, things to talk about, things to disclose, and things to do on the basis of similarities. Not to say that that's always true, right? There are people who might be very different, but nevertheless, a couple of century, but that oftentimes the narrative that opposites attract is not really responsive to how a lot of relationships play out. The easier to initiate and maintain relationships with people that share similarities with you. You're really into sports, right? And you're getting to know somebody that has zero interest at all in sports and doesn't want to watch a game or do anything like that. You're going to have fewer things to connect and talk about with that person. So oftentimes on the basis of self-disclosure, uh, opposites cannot necessarily attract. However, right, opposites have been shown to create initial excitement. Wow, this person is so different. They are so excited, right? They uh, really kind of stand out. Uh, and maybe that that creates an initial spark um, toward that person, but it can make it more difficult to understand over time uh, the needs that those people might have, right? If you come from a different cultural background, uh, it can be hard to connect with that person on different topics without a full understanding of where they're coming from and a desire to listen and meet uh, the needs that you have. So all important considerations here in terms of relationship development. So another theory that can be useful as you're preparing the exam and thinking about um, how to use these ideas um, is this idea of social exchange theory. So exchange theory is essentially saying that we are constantly making calculations about the relationships that we choose to have in our lives, right? Um, in other words, we are comparing our relationships to alternatives, um, whether or not we have different relationships or we don't have any relationships at all. And there's a formula that we use to determine the value of our relationships, right? We might say that the value of our relationship is equal to the positives or benefits minus the costs or negative parts of that relationship. We take the sum and we determine is our relationship net good or net bad to have, right? And as you could probably guess, this theory has generated a lot of critique. We as humans don't mathematically say, well, I think that you have 22,000 positivity points and 15,000 negative points. So I think overall, I'm going to spend the afternoon. Right? We don't do that. That's weird. Uh, but uh, what this theory does say is that we're less likely to continue relationships if we feel like those relationships are being directly harmful to us. So um, you might be familiar with the phrase, uh, a good relationship um, is at the top, no relationship, and then a bad relationship is at the bottom. Ways we might do this might include ghosting a person, right? No longer communicating with that person, um, reducing what we share with that person, uh, becoming a little bit more distant, um, or um, outright uh, ending a relationship that we see as no longer beneficial. And we can think about this mutually as well, right? Maybe you and a friend were good friends in high school, but you've gone in very different directions. You don't have much in common and you disagree on a lot of things. Maybe you decide that it's time to move on and do things differently. So social exchange theory is really trying to understand um, why we choose to have the relationships that we do. And there's also a lot of alternative explanations for why we continue to have relationships that might be negative, um, 
in a lot of cases, right, survivors of uh, abusive relationships remain in relationships uh, because it's necessary, right, because it's crucial for survival and well-being uh, compared to the cost of the alternative, right? Um, so we have to consider the role of somebody's autonomy and ability to manage a relationship in their decisions. Uh, but at the end of the day, right, we are thinking about what our relationships are bringing to the table. Um, so, um, you know, common phrase, used a lot in Gen Z, right, is to describe a relationship or individual as toxic, right? You're toxic. I don't want you in my life. That would be an example of social exchange theory by saying that the costs outweigh the benefits of that relationship. So we might continue to have relationships that are a net negative for us. We don't necessarily engage in a callous way of making those calculations, but we are considering how we maintain our relationships and contact with other people on the basis of the benefits versus the costs that we might be considering. You might be familiar with the phrase, birds of a feather flock together, right? This is the similarity thesis that we're drawn to relationships among people that have a variety of similarities uh, to who we are, right? So uh, one way this can be supportive is validation. Maybe you're really supportive of a local sports team that doesn't do so well, doesn't win very many games, right? But you keep um, hoping that they succeed each time. If you have another friend who's a fan, right? They can affirm and support your perspective. They can say, hey, I feel you. I really wish they won. Predictability is again a question of safety. If somebody is predictable with what they say and what they do can be considered consistent, we can feel comfortable around that person. Again, oftentimes we feel really uncomfortable and disoriented by a person who says or does something that is totally outside of what we expect. Like they start yelling and screaming and we've never seen them do that before. And then affiliation is this idea of a sense of shared identity. Do you have a set of similar experiences? Maybe um, you're also a fan of this team and you wear the same jersey, right? Um, you have a sense of common experience with that person. And again, this is not to say that relationships um, across different cultures and contexts aren't good, because absolutely there are a lot of relationships that are very different in terms of culture, identity, and background, just to say that the ability to generate a sense of shared identity might be unique to that couple or uh, group of people, right? That over time, members of a group develop affiliation, but there might be uh, additional upfront work that's required to develop this sense of shared identity. So Knapp and Banglisti lay out uh, the idea of stages of relationship development. And I want to explore this, and I'll be giving an example here of um, how these relationships uh, tend to happen, right? But when we think about relationship development, what we can think about is five different stages of how relationships develop and come together, and then five different stages of how relationships come apart, right? So this is not necessarily a linear path. In fact, there's a lot of relationships that get up here, and they stay up here. Right? Or there are relationships that get up here, start to go down, but might come back up. Right? Or there are also relationships that only really go up to some of these early stages. In fact, the majority of our relationships are at these early stages. So let's look at them in a little bit more detail. I'm going to share an example of this in action. So we have five stages of coming together. Right. Um, it's kind of funny because uh, a lot of people like on set, a lot of films, right? Like the Chris's, um, you know, like Chris Hemsworth, Chris Evans, so on in the Marvel films start to become really close with each other uh, just on the basis of interacting and being involved in the same project. Okay. So in coming together, relationships start with initiating a very brief initial contact with a person. It is meeting somebody, right? It's getting to know somebody. If you're watching a silly rom-com, Maybe they meet each other because they're getting groceries and suddenly they collide and knock each other over, right? Uh, oh, let me take your hand. And then they like look into each other's eyes, right? A lot of those early stages of relationships that tend to be brief, uh, they're very basic. They don't necessarily create a spark between people, but they are about understanding basic information. Experimenting is figuring out that other person and seeing if you want to go further. That might involve some screening, right? If you're interested in a relationship, you might talk about deal breakers uh, up front and might say, hey, do you want kids? Um, do you want to get married? Do you want a house, right? You might 
start with some of those things, or you might start to tease out some of the things that do that person care, right? Um, trying to understand if you get along. Intensifying is sharing more intimate and personal details. You feel comfortable with that person. You're starting to share, again, some of those uh, closer layers to yourself, some of your goals, some of your dreams, some of your hopes. Integrating, right? Um, so again, I grew up at a time where Facebook was a lot more popular and there was a lot of emphasis placed on becoming Facebook official, right? So-and-so and so-and-so -and -so are in a relationship, OMG. Um, that's the stage of integrating, is publicly uh, identifying as a couple. You watch like silly, um, like Hallmark romantic comedies, right? Um, one really big trope is it's the holidays and somebody has somebody that they're bringing with them to the holidays, right? They're at that stage of integration uh, and introduction to people close. And then bonding is a very public reveal, oftentimes through something like a ceremony, uh, such as a wedding, um, that might really publicly show the significance and meaning of that relationship. Right? So over time, right, a lot of our relationships stay up here. They might move up to this bonding stage. Not all of them do, of course, but some start to move in that direction. But, right, not all relationships last, um, and relationships also have different stages of coming apart. One of them might be differentiating, where you start to say, no, uh, we disagree on things, right? Or, um, you know, maybe uh, politically, you and somebody else disagree, and you vote different directions, right? So you start to say, well, I'm going to do things more on my own. Circumscribing is limiting your time with another person, right? Maybe you're more inclined to ghost them or do things with other people and focus on other relationships in your uh, life. Stagnating might involve being in a relationship and feeling like you don't really have anything to talk about or share with that person. Like a relationship isn't going anywhere. You aren't reaching the goals or hopes that you might want. Avoiding, right, is this feeling that the relationship is kind of on the rocks. Maybe you're arguing and fighting a lot and it's not going well, and you're actively trying to spend time away. Like, uh, I'm going to go on this trip, right, and spend some time away from the relationship. And then terminating, of course, would be choosing to end the relationship uh, in a variety of different ways, right? So not all relationships decay in this way, but uh, many do, right, and many do kind of following these different steps where relationships somewhat slowly uh, move in that direction. How many people have seen um, the movie 500 Days of Summer? It's like nobody in this class. Okay. So um, this is an interesting film uh, that came out uh, a while back, uh, starring uh, Zoe Deschanel and uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. And uh, I share this because I think that it's a really good example of uh, these 10 different relationship stages, right? And the film is somewhat nonlinear. Um, the film is following the characters, um, and Joseph Levitt's, Gordon Levitt's character in particular, um, in a nonlinear way, right? So he has been dating somebody for 500 days and the relationship ends, and he is kind of reflecting on and trying to understand uh, how the relationship developed and ended. And over the film, we we're presented the different days in the relationship but not in a linear way. So we see some parts of the relationship that are coming together, some that are coming apart, somewhere in between, and we can see how some of these uh, stages can play out. I love this one. Sorry. I said I love this one. You, 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 you're initiating. This is the story of boy and girl. The boy, Tom Hanks, grew up believing that he never would be happy until the day he met the one. The girl, Ben, did not feel this belief. You should know about not a love story. You think you should stop thinking. Okay. Something very important. Okay. 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 Okay.
So the pole film moves back and forth between some of these relationship stages and uh, the parts of both coming together, falling apart, right? Summer's character believes all relationships eventually end and reach those later stages. You also see some of the early stages you don't believe in your true love, uh, right? There's questions and differences in that relationship too. Again, an exploration of how relationships start and end. We'll talk a little bit more next class about the role of relationship maintenance, this idea that we use strategies in order to help to uh, work on our relationships. So what I want you to do um, is take some time here in the remaining few minutes that we have, um, and let's just focus on these first two questions here. So think about a relationship that you have in your own life. Uh, where does this fit in the 10 different stages of relationships that we have talked about so far? And what are some of the major things that you and that other person gain from the relationship? So uh, take some uh, time to think about this. And I will take you back to let's see.
It's like most people here about wrapped up. So um, remember for today to continue to work on and develop a game plan for completing that essay. Let me know by the end of the day today if you need an extension. Talked about some of the elements of relationships, including the stages of coming together and coming apart. We'll talk a little bit more about relationship maintenance and a couple ideas we couldn't get to uh, next class. Um, once you have finished this, please pass forward it or email it to me. Have a great rest of your Monday, and I'll see you again for Wednesday's class. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay, I'm going to get there.